Mark It can graduated from our program summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa and followed it with his JD from Berkeley. Mark Itcombe was an associate in the music department of the law firm of Mitchell, Silderberg, and Knapp, and joined the William Morris Agency in 1982 to become a television packaging agent specializing in first-run syndication, pay and basic cable, cable television. Mr. Itkin has packaged a variety of television series that have forever changed television um, and our viewing habits, including The Real World, Project One Way, Hell's Kitchen, Kitchen Nightmares, Deal or No Deal, Extreme Makeover Home Edition, Tyler Perry's House of Pain, Tyler Perry's Meet the Browns, Big Brother, Fear Factor, The People's Court, The Ricky Lake Show, American Gladiators, Biggest Loser, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm sure that each of you have been touched in one or more ways by <laughs> Mr. Itkin's offerings. Until December of 2015, Mr. Itkin was co-head of television and a member of the board of directors at William Morris Endeavor. He's a corporate board of directors, consultant, entrepreneur in the media business. He has been a member of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences for 18 years, a two-term governor, and spent six years on their executive committee. In addition, he chaired the Blue Ribbon Panel Committee, which successfully instituted at-home viewing of the Primetime Emmy Awards, and it currently is the chairman of their Hall of Fame Committee. Mr. Itkin was also the first agent appointed to the National Association of Television Programming Executives Executive Board. He is currently on the Board of Governors of Cedar sinai Hospital, on the Board of Directors of the Zimmerman Children's Museum, and on the Board of Directors of the Paley Center for Media. Mr. Itkin has been the recipient of numerous awards, too numerous to mention this evening, both within the television industry and beyond, and we have been delighted to welcome him back to campus this week as our Bruin in residence. Mark is joined this evening by Harvey Levin, a producer, investigative reporter, attorney, and executive producer of the TMZ Brands. Mr. Levin received nine Emmy Awards and numerous other local and national awards and investigate, for investigative reporting at NBC and CBS affiliates in Los Angeles. Mr. Levin has created a new series called Objectified, which I have heard details about in the green room just before now. Look for it this fall on Fox News Channel. Prior to TMZ, Mr. Levin created and served as the executive producer for the syndicated series Celebrity Justice. Prior to its launch, he served as the co-executive producer and consultant for the television show The People's Court, and he continues to host the interactive segments of the show. Mr. Levin also served as the executive consultant on the syndicated program Moral Court and managing editor of the program Superior Court. He spent a decade as an investigative reporter for KCBS-TV in Los Angeles and covered numerous high-profile court <clears> cases <throat> for a number of the top CBS, CBS stations across the country, including affiliates in New York and Chicago. For seven years, Mr. Levin was a legal columnist for the Los Angeles Times. Additionally, he hosted radio talk shows for KABC-AM and KMPC-AM in Los Angeles. Mr. Levin graduated from the University of Chicago Law School, began his career as a litigator in a prestigious law firm in Los Angeles, and has been a professor at three law schools. He also served as a consultant for the American Bar Association and has testified before Congress on behalf of the organization. <laughs> Once again, I would like to thank you all for being here tonight, and folks, I think we're in for quite a treat. So um, Harvey and I have been the closest of friends for over 35 years, but we've never interviewed one another. We've had a lot of intimate conversations, but we've never interviewed one another. Um, but what we found out when we became friends is that we have very similar roots. Uh, we're two Jewish boys that grew up in the West San Fernando Valley in the 60s. He in Reseda, I in Canoga Park. No connections to the legal business, no connections to the entertainment business, but with a lot of dreams and ambition. And um, it, has, uh, it, it has been an exciting ride for both of us and I think beyond our wildest dreams. So Harvey, um, Cleveland High School, graduate, 
what comes next? Uh, I just wanted to get out of the valley. <laughs> I mean, it's really true. And so uh, that's actually true. And I um, took a drive to uh, UCSB, and that was it for me. Um, and I just thought, this is where I want to spend four years. So I did. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole story, but I, the, the one thing that really stands out is I never really planned on going to law school. And um, I, I loved political science at UCSB. So one of my professors said, you should get a PhD in poli-sci and teach. And so um, he said, great school is University of Wisconsin. You should go there. So I went to University of Wisconsin, and it was a very early program. And what I found was that I enjoyed water skiing more than I enjoyed the classes, because they have a <coughs> great lake there. And, um, and so I realized I wasn't going to do this. I just didn't have my heart in it. And I had sent a resume to um, some law schools, uh, including University of Chicago. And, the, um, and I thought, you know, I'll get a master's and then go to law school the following year. So the, uh, weeks went by, and I finally said, you know, what am I getting a master's for in political science? What am I going to do with this? So I, I decided to, you know, I would quit and come back to California, and I had a job lined up in Sacramento and an apartment that I rented, and I remembered that the dean at University of Chicago had said, you know, you're reasonably close, so if you're ever in the area, come by and, you know, and say hello. So I thought, you know, I'll do that. So I had a six-hour layover from Madison to California, and I jumped in a cab. I, my bags were at the airport. I jumped in a cab, went to the law school, and this, I remember this. It was October 11th. And they were on the quarter system, so they were a week and a half in to a nine-week quarter. And I sat down with the dean, and we talked about nothing. And he said, how'd you like to go to law school? <clears throat> and I said, well, I said, I spent $20 in a cab ride one way. And I said, of course I want to go to law school. And he said, well, look, somebody just dropped out of the first year class two hours ago. You want a spot? <laughs> and I, I wasn't sure what I was even going to do and, uh, uh, the following year. But I, I said, you know, I went through the list with him. Mark mentioned we were Jewish. So I, I mentioned all of the negatives here, that I had no money. I had never been in Chicago. I would be hopelessly behind. It was, um, you know, my bags were at the airport. I had an apartment. And so the guy looks at me and he says, you know, you worry too much. He said, <laughs> he said, he said, you know, we might not admit you next year. You're, take, you're taking a chance if you say no because you're rolling the dice. And so I thought about it for a couple of minutes, and I said, OK. I said, I'm in. And he said, well, you're not exactly in. He said, he said I got to convene the admissions committee. So what I'd like you to do is see if you can delay your flight rather than cancel it in case we don't admit you. So I literally delayed the flight. They met. He comes back out, and he says, congratulations. He said, we admitted you. And I said, that's fabulous. I said, where do I sleep tonight? <laughs> and I had no idea. He said, you can stay with a registrar. And she lived, you've heard Bad, Bad Leroy Brown, she lived on the south side of Chicago, um, south of the law school. And I didn't know anything about this at the time. But uh, he said, go get your bags at the airport. So I got in a cab, went to the airport, got my bags. And on the way back down, the cab driver said to me, um, he said, so where are you from? And I told him, and he said, he said he was from Boyle Heights. And I told him, I said, my dad's from Boyle Heights. And he looked at me and he said, you must be a kike. And he said that to me. And then he pulled a knife on me. And then he took all my money. And he took me to the south side of Chicago in an area where the single greatest cause of death for white males under 25 was murder and dumped my bags out. I don't know why he, he didn't want my junk. And so he took, he dumped my bags out and I was standing in the street with all my bags and no money and it was dark. And I just remember saying, welcome to Chicago. <laughs> and that's how I started law school. So, you know, so much of life is accidental. And um, that was the beginning of a lot of accidents. And so, um, Harvey, what was the um, sort of pivotal moment where, uh, or, or the big break where you went from being the legal scholar to turning it into a media business? 
Um, I'm surveying the room, and I think most of you probably do not remember this. But I, I was teaching law school, and um, my, the dean of the law school where I taught um, was the head of a campaign in California, the No On Proposition 13 campaign. Proposition 13 limited property taxes. And there was a guy named Howard Jarvis who became a folk hero. He was at the time, I think, 78 years old. And he became this folk hero who's going to save California. And the dean said, look, everybody who's debating this guy is getting creamed because they all have vested interests. And I need somebody to debate this guy. And he said, your advantage is you live in an apartment. You have no history. I would think I was 27 years old. And he said, you have no history. And so he's going to have a harder time with you. And so I went and debated him. And we started doing this kind of dog and pony show around, around the state, ultimately. But we did radio a lot. And um, he got you know, 80% of the vote by, you know, during the election. So I failed miserably. And thank God I did, because he was right. But um, anyway, I, 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 I got a call from KBC Radio. And they said, we want to put you on the radio. Um, and give, you can give legal advice once a week. And he said, and they said, and we got a great idea. You're going to be Dr. Law. <laughs> so for a year, I was Dr. Law <laughs> on KBC. And then, the, then I started doing the same thing for newspapers. And then just over time, you know, again, things just happen. OK, I got a question for you with a preface. Um, my career was, a, I had safety nets. I mean, it's kind of like a trapeze artist where there's a safety net. So if you go from one ring to the other, um, and if you fall, it's not going to hurt that bad. Because um, what, I, what I always did was, you know, I pursued my passion, but always had something to kind of support me. He didn't. <laughs> and I, I am interested in your story about you know, going to a top law school and realize, because ultimately, I think <coughs> life is about passion. And it's ultimately, it's about finding your passion. Because it is at least half you know, in terms of achieving. And, and, and it's something you really need to want. And sometimes you go down a path, and you get invested. And most people, when they're far, far enough along the path, they don't stop. They don't deviate. They just keep going. And then 20 years later, they realize they're not particularly happy, but they don't know how to get out of it. He went down a path, and he did something that I, and I've seen a lot of people you know, in my career. He did something I think is kind of remarkable. You got to tell the story about being in a law firm and saying, not for me. This is great. <laughs> well. I um, I got accepted to uh, I mean I was I was in my last year at Bolt Hall at Berkeley, and I really thought I wanted to I knew that if I was going to practice law I really didn't want to be a lawyer but if I was going to practice law I better be in the entertainment industry because that's what I was genuinely interested in, and I knew two areas of the entertainment industry really well music and television, and there was. Um, a, a law firm, Mitchell Silberberg and Up, that was the best music law firm in the country. And I figured, well, you know, what, what do you got to lose? And I had the interview, and I got the job. And, um, and I went there, and I was miserable because I would sit in my little office and draft agreements, and I would say to myself, well, I know it will probably change at some point, but I can't do this the rest of my life. And I was in the law library, and I, it's, it's like being in school again. And I just spent 19 years in school. So um, after a year and a half, um, I just very boldly said, I'm not happy doing this. I remember it was a Sunday. I was sitting in the office, and it was a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I said, I'm sitting in this law office draw, draw, drafting agreements on a Sunday afternoon. I'm getting out of here. And um, it was October. And, um, and I gave my notice I was going to leave at the end of the year, and I did. And what I did, the, the day that I left, and I don't know, my mom is sitting here, and she probably doesn't remember this, but I went out and bought a sports car. 
<laughs> because I felt so emancipated. My parents, my dad lent me some of the money to buy the sports car, um, but I felt so emancipated, and I didn't really know what I was going to do next. And uh, I, I moved back up to San Francisco, where I went to law school, because San Francisco is a great place to go when you don't really know what you want to do. And, um, and I, after about eight months, I was so terribly bored that, um, and I, would be, I was watching TV a lot, and I would see all these cool shows like uh, Harvey on People's Court and Solid Gold, and I'm thinking, the world's passed me by. I, I, gotta, I gotta get back into it. And so I called um, a manager friend, a guy that I actually had bartended for at, at parties for his clients, um, when I was in, in uh, an undergrad, and I asked him, I said, well, what should I do? And he says, well, I think you'd be a really good agent. And I, and I never, ever in a million years had ever thought about being an agent. He says, well, I'm going to set you up at the, at the William Morris Agency with some of my friends. And, and I went and I had a meeting there. And then I also had a really close fraternity brother uh, named Mark Raboff, who was in the first mailroom at CAA. And he says to me, well, if you're interviewing at William Morris, just come interview here at CAA. And so I, I went and had the meeting at CAA, and the guy interviewing me is a guy named Ray Kurtzman. And he says, and he was a lawyer, and he says to me, he says, I just can't imagine how anybody who's already been a lawyer making $30,000 a year would want to start in the mailroom. And I said, well, I'm not here for my health. I mean, I really genuinely want to do something different. And he didn't hire me. And on, uh, and on uh, I remember it was in the days when people still worked over the Christmas holiday. I went and had a meeting with Jerry Katzman at the William Morris Agency on December 31st, 1981. And uh, Jerry had been, Jerry was a lawyer, but he was the head of the television department. And he totally understood uh, what, how I felt about being a lawyer. And he hired me and I started January, in January 1982 in the mailroom. Uh, you know, at the bottom, but I figured, you know what, it was kind of like going back to grad school, getting paid a little bit of money, and um, six weeks later, I was on a desk as an assistant, and I was able to go into uh, an area that was kind of just beginning, but it was an area that I knew and I loved and that nobody in the world had any interest in doing, and that was in the daytime and first run syndication business. I mean, everybody wanted to be in prime time. And, um, but I knew that other business. I'd done actually a paper here in communication studies on daytime TV. So I'm, I'm there doing my thing. And uh, it just morphed into so many, I mean, there were so many interesting things that happened along the way um, and people who entered my life and allowed me to kind of be the, first guy planting the flag in, you know, in the non-scripted business. There's a lesson there. There really is a lesson there. So I, I want to I ask you something, because um, it's always, um, I, I'm always so impressed by the fact that what you do and what you've done, like when you, <laughs> when he covered O.J. Simpson, and he knew the O.J. Simpson case better than anybody else in this town. <laughs> and I remember that, he, that the, the news, uh, the station, I don't know if it was NBC or CBS, who he worked for at the time, gave him a bodyguard that stood outside his house um, while he was covering uh, the O.J. Simpson, because he just knew things that nobody else knew. But in your, you know, you, you've, you've been an innovator, and you've, you've created an amazing business, and you're really the first person who took something from the digital side and made it successful in the, you know, in the linear television side with TMZ. But the content you do, Harvey, is so controversial, but you never get sued. <laughs> because he's so diligent in the way, and he's got so much integrity, and I think the most thing is the trust. Yeah, I mean, I see, I don't really see it as that different from what I did for many years at NBC, at CBS, for the LA Times. You know, ultimately, TMZ 
fundamentally, and this is why I did it, it's a news operation. And you know, the, the heart of it is a news operation. And a news operation can be covering the White House, it can be covering Britney Spears. I mean, honestly, you use the same skill set. It is the same skill set that, you know, I developed a skill set over many years as a reporter. And, you know, when I decided to start TMZ, it was as simple as this. I just said, you know what, there are no news operations online. And there's a huge vacuum in entertainment news because everything was red carpet. And I found red carpet boring as shit. And, you know, it, the idea of these pre-scripted answers where publicists were managing everything and half the things were lies and, you know, and it, leveraging, you know, uh, television shows saying, we'll give you so-and-so if you tell this story, whether it's true or not, and they would do it. And it just seemed like so, it seemed so ridiculous and fake that, you know, I saw this, there was a wide open field to do something that's real. And you can do a news operation. You follow the news. And if, you know, there's a great book out. Um, I think it's called Summer of 27. Um, and, and, you know, it's about all these crazy things that happened in 1927, where, you know, Charles Lindbergh landed in Paris, Babe Ruth, you know, broke the home run record. There were just a million things that happened. And I, I, there's, a, there's a, a passage in there where they talk about, you know, people were so interested in Babe Ruth that the Chicago Tribune had a weekly column on Babe Ruth's bunions. His bunions. And it was the most read column in the newspaper because he was a celebrity and people were interested. And when you look at this and that, you know, sports stars are huge celebrities and, you know, obviously people in entertainment, politicians are celebrities. And when you look at this and you think, who's covering the, that side of it? Nobody. And then if you create an operation that has the rigors of any other news operation, you know, where you have lawyers um, who vet things, you have researchers who vet, you have producers who have integrity, who know how to do stories. Well, then it's pretty simple that if you're digital, you don't have publishing cycles like a magazine, you don't have uh, time periods like a television show. When you get it right, you get it up. And therefore, you can beat everybody. I mean, it was that simple. So it's basically applying, you know, every, I don't give us that much credit. I mean, to me, this is, you know, creating a news operation in that, that where there was this huge void and applying it to a certain area, which is celebrity news, but doing it differently, not doing the same presentation that everybody else was doing and just, you know, creating that niche and that's what it. Well, and there's a, there's a big lesson in that, and that is looking at being observant and looking at the world and seeing where there are voids. And people say, oh, well, you know, everything's been done and blah, 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 and that's so untrue, and, uh, and that's a great example and a great lesson. Which, which then kind of leads to you, which is that, and, and this is something that I've learned in, in entertainment, um, well, my whole career, which is that, you know, I have seen... Um, Mark and I know people, you know, who um, we kind of struggled early on. I mean, I remember we used to go to this Mexican restaurant and we would figure out who had the most money on any given night to pay. And, uh, and we did. And we knew people, just interacting with them, who hit it big early. And we would kind of look at them and they'd hit it big. But what I took away from it was that they, you're going to, you know, because you wanted to be a reporter. And I said, you go, and that usually doesn't work. And it definitely doesn't work in entertainment. That there are shifting tastes, and, you know, and there are innovations, and most people don't latch onto it. So many things are just derivative and boring and white noise. What he was able to do, and this is what I want to understand, because Mark did this for decades, that you somehow... I, I want to figure out how you, because you, you said uh, nobody was in this field and all that. I get it. But you constantly were thinking of trends and where to move your business. I don't see anybody else doing it the way you did it. And how, I wanted, how did you figure that out with a law background 
that had nothing to do with what you ended up doing. Mm, that's fine. Now, uh, we haven't, by the way, tr honestly, genuinely have not rehearsed this. So he's asking me questions <laughs> and asking him questions that we, we intentionally did it that way. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the answer to that is having a very populist, I think where we grew up had a lot to do with molding our tastes, very populist tastes. I mean, we're middle-class kids in the San Fernando Valley without any snobberies, without any really discrimination with respect to what you watched on TV or the music you listened to or what have you. And I think that ability, that, that I guess what you call today the Walmart sensibility, the, you know, the common man sensibility, allowed me, gave me that gut for what um, I thought would work. And I was never satisfied resting on my laurels. You know, and I had success, but I wanted to have, and it wasn't just financial success, it was, you know, it was, it was having the, the feeling of really, you know, building something and doing something different than no one had done before. And so, you know, um, I think it's, you know, just keeping, being observant as to, as you, as you did, Harvey, looking at the world and saying, well, what's not there? And I was in the, mo in, in the television business, as you know, because you, you've built a great career in this end of the business. The first run syndication business, game shows, talk shows, magazine shows, is th in, in our business is looked upon as the most unsexy part of the business. But if you talk to Mark Goodson, Oprah Winfrey, Merv Griffin, uh, Dr. Phil, Harvey Levin, Judge Judy, it's a business. It's an incredible business and it remains an incredible business. And I always thought, wow, I can take this populist taste and, and, and do something with it. And I did. And like I said, I never settled for just resting on my laurels. And, and, and it's grasping opportunities that are sitting in front of you that you see, you know. But, but you're, do, you're doing you know, incredibly successful, groundbreaking shows like Ricky Lake, and all of a sudden you realize there are talk shows are a real business, and then you pivot to something like Big Brother, which is totally different. Well, because the business, it continues to evolve, and, and I think utilize, there were the same, the, some of the producers that were doing the non-scripted stuff in syndication became the producers in, like the Buna Murrays of the world, in the real world, became the producers of this kind of new genre in non, non-scripted television. And then, you know, the, the, the non-scripted business, because I was dealing globally, all of a sudden, America gets sick of the sitcom business and the drama business, because everything's derivative, and the, it, the, like the table is set to bring non-scripted business to life, and all that's been being developed overseas because they can't afford to do scripted TV. So being put in that situation and realizing, wow, you know, I remember when my partner Bradley and I went Thanksgiving 1999 to Holland to um, see, to go to visit the Big Brother set. And looking at this and saying, I mean, there was the real world, but now you see this thing on a huge scale. I'd never seen anything like it before. And to, to be able to bring this back to the States, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was exciting and to kind of open up a new genre. And, and uh, um, I, I think it's just being observant and loving what you do. I mean, you love what you do. And when you love what you do, I think you have great success. And, uh, and passion, as you said, Harvey, because I think passion is, is even more than half. I think it's, remember Brandon Tartikoff in his autobiography said it was 90% of a pitch. If someone came in passionate, he would give them a deal if he thought 90% was the passion. Um, but there are dumbasses with passion. <laughs> there are dumbasses, yeah. I mean. Yes, 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 yes. Um, well, you know, we're supposed to talk about what, 10 years from now, there's not going to be any TV or internet, or Sorry. is there going to be? And I, maybe we should just spend a couple minutes talking about it, because, you know, <laughs> unless you don't want to talk about it. Well, I'm on a mission for this. I mean, I, I've been talking about this for 
several years now. But I really believe in five to ten years there is not going to be television. Without a doubt. I totally agree. And there will not be an internet. There will not be an internet. And I really believe that. And it's, there are few things that are clear to me ten years down the road. This one is, and I'll tell you why. When you look at this, and you look at this screen, whether it's this or whether it's a TV screen at home or whatever it is, you go to this for two reasons, aside from using a phone or whatever, if you want to watch something. You go to it for entertainment and information, right? There is nothing else you use this for um, in terms of programming, news, whatever it is. Entertainment, information, that's it. Content. That's the content, entertainment or information. Those two things. So now that these screens are integrated, you know, where you, know, you, can, you can go to the internet or you could watch a TV program on it, why is there a dividing wall where you say, okay, I'm gonna go to the internet with this, and then, but I'm gonna go to television for this. Why? I mean, what is the function of saying, I'll have this divider here, and this is internet? No, I mean, all I care about is give me the best entertainment, give me the best information. What do I care whether it's called television or internet? What, what I think is going to happen, and it's so obvious, is that you take assets, best assets from broadcast or best assets from digital in creating programming. So if I'm going to do something on North Korea, you know, I'm going to pull assets from, you know, from digital, maybe photo galleries and, you know, and, and text, and then pull, you know, use, use video assets that are traditionally broadcast, but put them together in an experience with depth and richness, and I want to present to you the best current story on North Korea that I can possibly give you, because there are going to be 20 other people who are going to be doing the same thing I'm doing. I have to distinguish myself from everybody else. I have to attract you to this screen and come to the menu and hit my story, my program. So how do I do it? By taking all these assets, by, by making a rich experience using those assets from, what do I care about calling it television? It's, it's not. I mean, I call it in my office and they laugh at me, I call it intervision. And it's a combination of the two. And you, you, you have a big menu, and then you categorize things, and whatever you want to see, whether it's a drama that could be 14 minutes or an hour or a half hour, whatever it is, you know, it's right there in the menu. And you can market it the way you, but you don't have to market it through studios or networks or anything else. You can market it right on the menu. You can market it anywhere you want. But I have to then sell you that I've got the best program um, on whatever it is, or I've just got a good, unique program. But what do you care about calling it television or internet? It's all here, and whether it's all text, whether it's all photos, whether it's all video, whether it's all interactivity, or a combination of all of them, that's good programming. And that's all this is about, it's programming. So you don't need television, you don't need the internet. What you need is somebody producing good entertainment, good information, putting it on a menu and selling it to the world. And that's, to me, where everything's moving. And it seems inevitable. Why would you have that dinosaur of these two things that don't need to be separate anymore? You don't need it. You don't need either of them. You need a new experience. And what I think the common theme of everything we're talking about is that you know everybody does what they've done before because it's comfortable and they understand it and you know this makes a lot of people in my world nervous to talk about because there are a lot of people who have done television who never not even learned digital yet and digital to me is getting really mature <laughs> and I think this is where things are moving but they didn't learn it because they're television people and if they're television people, 
it threatens them to say, now I've got to learn what a 25-year-old has to learn, and they're probably going to do it better. So if I get into that world, I'm going to fail. So rather than failing in that world, I'll stay in my world and keep doing what I'm doing. But that ignores the reality that everything's merging. And especially now that it's merging, if you didn't learn this, how are you going to do this? And I think, honestly, that's my biggest, one of my biggest criticisms of traditional media and the business. It's that everything has been done the same way for 50 and 60 years. And that's only because the people running it, a lot of them, were scared. They didn't want to learn this, so they just did this. And now that it's going to go like this, they're in for a major shock. So that's my spiel. Well, and, and, and the theme there, I think, which also kind of brings it back to our lives, is being fearless. Because that's really what you just commented on, is fearlessness, not being afraid. And, I, and, and the buyers today, one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to retire when I did was, the frustration of having to pitch television shows to people that were so afraid of losing their job if they bought something new and different. And new and different is the only thing that's going to rise above the clutter. It's the only thing that's going to get ratings. It's the only thing that's going to get people excited and to talk about on social media. And, and the fear factor in our business, and in, 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 in almost any business, is is so prevalent that you got to figure out different ways of doing things, which is what I'm doing in, 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 in my new life. And, you know, as, as Harvey, as you can see, um, way above, way ahead of the curve, as always. Um, and, you, and you can see, not just from talking to, like, Kate, for example, who I've spent the last three wonderful days with, who is a cord cutter. She's 32 years old. She's a cord cutter. And I, I ask her what her tastes are, and you, know, and, you, and you see that you now have a whole new generation of people that are doing exactly what Harvey said. They want the best, the highest quality, and hence that's why you see people talking about what's on Netflix, what's on Hulu, what's on, on Amazon, not really what's on NBC or CBS or Fox or what have you. And, and, and I had, you know, I, I've told this so many times the last three days, but I had my own experience where, you know, I tried to sell something new and different that was very provocative to a traditional broadcast network who, didn't, who said it was too provocative. And that's exactly why they should have bought it. And they went with something extremely safe. And it was a huge failure. And a smart buyer in the cable world ended up buying this show. So, um, you're, you've, you have, again, predicted you're prophetic, and, uh, and that's why you have the great success I, that you have. I, I want to give you one other example, because to me, I, I really connect with this. When I was 11 years old, I was at the public library in Reseda, and there was a guy named Maury Green who worked for this sure. show called The Big News, which was mm -hmm. the first local newscast in America with Jerry Dumphy as the anchor. And I watched him do a stand-up outside the public library, and I remember saying, I want to do this someday. I thought, I want to do this someday. This is so cool. And just telling stories, and I was, that was it for me. I mean, honestly, when I was in law school, I was so intoxicated still with news that I, I secretly sent 100 resumes out to every, st I, I would be living in Biloxi, Mississippi, if they would have said yes. Um, I was trying to get a job at a news station, and I couldn't. And, um, and I was intoxicated by it. But as time has gone on, it's like what I watched, what I watched when I was 11 years old is the same damn newscast that is on today. It is an anchor throwing to some reporter in the field who repeats what the anchor basically just said and then throws to a package with voice over sound, voice over sound, voice over sound, comes back to the anchor who then wants to say something additional, which could have been said in the package, but he wants some FaceTime, so says something stupid, and then throws to the anchor who says, I'm sure you'll be following this, which is vacuous. And then they move on. Well, that's local, that has been news for 60 years. 
And when you look at cable news, which was innovative 30 years ago, it's dudes and chicks at a desk with experts who don't get paid, who want to be on TV. And who insult your intelligence. And yeah, yeah. And, and it's, but it's this, it is the same thing. And people are bored with it. And that's why 10 years ago, they stopped putting cable in dorms. Because young people don't care about it. And you know how I know this? It's really easy. Watch local news. In fact, you know, I, I will tell you, a, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to get off on this too much. I just got back from Israel. And I was talking with somebody who was in the government there, and they're interested in figuring out how to reach people. And, and they want new ways of reaching, reaching people, and young people, too. And we were talking about it, and they were talking about, local, about network news. And I, just, I, I said to this guy, I said, you know, you know who's watching by the commercials. They're about drugs and death. And those with, that's, that's who, they're all 60 plus. And there are not new people coming in. You know how that ends, right? I mean, you know how the story ends. When no new people are coming in and everybody has aged out and they're 60 plus and it's the same group of people that are, you know, the pool that everybody's vying for. So about a year ago, I had an idea and, I, and, and I, it's just a passion of mine and it would have been a, it's a terrible business move for me because it would have taken a lot of time, but I had this idea. And it's just a new type of newscast. And the idea was, I'll tell you, because I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do this now, I'm, I, but, but the idea was this. You go to a place like Madison, Wisconsin, and you start advertising around the city, and you say that anybody who gives us a video that is authentic, or a photo of, of, a news, of a news event that's going on, or you know, gives us a story that we verify, we'll give you $100. We'll give you $100. Why not? We're making, if, if I'm gonna deputize you as you know, street journalists or whatever these cable companies are calling it now, why should they not get paid? I mean, last time I looked, you know, CNN's not a charitable organization. They make money. So if somebody gives them a story or gives them a video, first of all, everybody pays for video. I mean, that's just a myth. But the point is, I'm, we're honest about it. And I have no problem paying for video because why not? You know, the video is the video is the video. And if it's authentic video, what do I care whether a stringer shot it or, so, or you shot it? You know, I'm going to pay for it with a stringer. What's the difference? It doesn't taint the video. but. I can deputize this whole room. I can deputize Madison, Wisconsin, and say, look, I, my station, my newscast doesn't have 16 reporters. My newscast has a million. And, and their newscast, they can only be at 16 places at once. I can be at every block in this city. And all you have to do is call this number, and all you have to then do is send in the video, upload the video, we'll take it, and if we like it, and we can authenticate it, we'll pay you a hundred bucks. And all of a sudden, I've, I'm everywhere. And then I can, and then, you know, I'm not gonna do a fancy anchor desk or anything else. I'm gonna have some dude or, or a woman at an assignment desk who's gonna be the tra air traffic controller. And that's the person who's gonna be presenting all this stuff. So I pitched it to a big news operation that's all over the country. They couldn't do it. They loved it. You know why? The unions freaked out. It, 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 they, they threatened a revolt because obviously it would eliminate jobs. So we do the same thing over and over and over again until it's white noise. And that's the state of the media right now, I think. So why don't you do that the way you did it with TMZ? Well, I mean, look, that, this is something I had thought about for a while, and it would be, it, it, it's such a full-time, I mean, I, I got enough jobs. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I'm serious. It would be, this is a 24-hour-a-day job to launch something like this, and I, and I wanted to do it against my better judgment and would have, and I think I knocked some sense into me. But all, my reason for saying it is that 
you know, nobody's, nobody's really thinking about new, like, th that's why Mark is so successful, is that he, he, he had the foresight to realize that it, things become white noise at a point. Things get oversaturated. People want new things. People want different presentations. He figured that out, but it's not specific in his profession. That's the case in life. And, and that's why things, you know, what is this thing? Uh, there's this horrible like, thing that guys are wearing, these onesie type things. What's it called? Does anybody? Oh, I mean, they're hideous, but they're different. And all of a sudden, it's become a thing, right? OK, well, I mean, this is my version of the romper in news. <laughs> and, you know, but, but again, but this was panic, and nobody wanted to do it. And frankly, I, I, I think it would be, I think it would be, it would breathe life in, and it invests people in their community. It gets them interested in what other people are doing. You create almost a competition among people if you do it right. I mean, it just seems like it's well, got Well, and it's a totally, it's different. totally in, in the spirit of social media. Right. So, but. If anybody does it, he gets, do it without him. You know? <laughs> well, then I'll sue you. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want him suing you. No. Um, so, um, I, does anyone have any questions they want to ask uh, Harvey or, or me? Yeah. So, I guess my question is obviously, the idea of bringing television and inter internet together seems like a great idea. But don't you think like um, a roadblock could potentially be like advertisement? because that's a really big industry and if people don't know how they're going to advertise or how they fit into that and it could potentially deplete a lot of jobs, do you think that could be well, an issue? Well, I mean, th the answer to that is, and it kind of falls under the theme of this fearlessness, is you find other ways, you, you have to train corporate America different ways of, of, of marketing their products. So just as the world of product integration happened, or, you know, in, in things like pay cable where you can't, where you don't advertise, you find new ways of reaching, you, you, you know, the, the beauty of all of this uh, social media is that you know exactly who you're talking to. So you can actually even pinpoint better for an advertiser a message that you want to reach a certain demographic. I mean, not only that, I mean, that's so true. But it's, you know, so what? People advertised one way for 50 years. So what? I mean, when, when we started TMZ, you know, we had to go out there and sell TMZ, and people were afraid to buy it. They were, well, well, what if you do a negative story? You know, all these questions that over time, you know, you overcome. And there are all, it, it, and it's constantly changing. I mean, the way we advertise today on digital is way different than it was 10 years ago. Fundamentally different. So what if I'm right, and what if this happens where there's this integration? So you stitch in uh, a pre stitchal where you can't fast forward. Well, OK, there you go. So there is a 15-second ad that you attach to whatever I'm presenting to you that you, if you want to see my, my, my um, program or whatever it is, you're gonna have to watch 15 seconds. And then if I've got a good program and I can get a million sets of eyeballs on it, I'm gonna sell more than the guy who got 300,000 sets of eyeballs. So it's the same principle, you just gotta find new ways of doing it. It's, I mean, this is not an obstacle. It's just, you look at the landscape of what you've got and then you find a creative way to um, make money off of it. There's a reason why so many of the advertisers or, you know, or even the the end user, the platforms, have redirected advertising from traditional broadcast to digital because they know there are benefits and greater benefits, you know, in the latter. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned this thing is used for information <coughs> or entertainment. I'm concerned about the melding of the boundaries. Uh, where does the information, well, how do we validate information? You talked about authenticating videos, uh, but we now have alternate facts. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have information that people really don't know how 
to assess appropriately and how it seems to me many of us are now at a point where information and entertainment are the same. I mean, we just elected an entertainer as president. <laughs> That's true. But, but, a couple of things. A couple what of means can we go about to start, uh, to, to get, if you're gonna get the authenticated video, how are we gonna authenticate information? Okay. Um, you can authenticate information, whether it's entertainment or news or what you call information. It's, it's the same process. It's like if, it, you know, we, we, we did a story on Mel Gibson where he had a rant on Pacific Coast Highway. Okay, is that entertainment? Is that, you know, uh, news? Call it what you want. I don't care what the label is. Just get it right. I mean, get it right. That's the point that, you know, if, you know, my big thing was we had to go out and prove from nothing that we were a credible source. Well, how do you do that? Okay, whether it's a Mel Gibson story or some stupid Britney Spears story that we do, we just got to get it right. People have, look, when we started this, I remember we got, um, CNN called us up and um, when we broke a story early on and they said, um, we like that story a lot and we'd like to use it, can you tell us who your sources are? And I said, screw you. I said, why would I tell you who our sources are? First of all, it's a complete violation of journalistic principles to do that. And secondly, don't be a lazy ass. Get it, get it yourself. And, and if you want our story, credit us. We're not gonna give you this video, credit us. Or whatever it was that they wanted from us. And they wouldn't. And this was Pavlov's, Pavlov's dog. I knew exactly what was going to happen. So, you know, we needed to make sure that we got it right. And we did. And the next day, they did the story. And this happened three or four more times. And what they realized, and I will give myself credit in this, I thought this through. And this, is, this was always the plan. That three or four times into this, they realized they don't want to be a day late anymore. And so, they realized we're going to trust them as long as they're right. And all of a sudden, they started crediting us. And the reason I did that was we never charged for any of these videos when we gave it to people. We, this is how we branded ourselves. But it's about being right. Who cares what you call it? Who cares whether it's about whether Celine Dion canceled her concerts or whether it's about Donald Trump uh, having a talk with James Comey? Who cares? It's the same principle. Get it right. Is there fake news out there? Yes. Is there a problem with the internet? Of course. Um, you know, somebody puts a story out and then it's easy to just do the story and say, well, so-and-so said it without vetting it yourself. And that's what's happening right now. But guess who's doing that? Traditional media is doing that. And the president. Well, <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but, but that, the problem is not news versus entertainment. That's not the problem. The problem is, that people have just gotten sloppy and lazy. And that it's easier, it's easier to say, to fill your website up, to fill your television show up with um, this salacious story, and then you just credit it to somebody else. And then you get the salacious, you get two minutes worth on the air. That's the problem. It's not entertainment versus news. And I will say one other thing. I don't know if you remember this, but when television really started amping up with news, Newspapers turned their nose up and said, oh, television, they can't do news. So it's the same principle. It's just, do you do it right or do you not do it right? Hello. Hi. Hi. So um, obviously you guys are very successful and have had amazing careers. You talked a little bit about the challenges of pitching new concepts to people who are used to doing things the old way. I'm wondering if you can share some of your Secrets for success of breaking through to people, being innovators, being pioneers. How were you able to keep the ball moving forward? Well, persistence is if you really, if you feel it in your gut. Like, you know, again, I, some of the people who have been here have sat in some of the classes, but I've, I know, so I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, you know, when, when this guy brings me from Youngstown, Ohio, and he sits on my desk, uh, this banner, it shows two guys locked and it says on the bottom, American Gladiators. There's no television show, but what a great title. 
can you imagine what you could turn that into, you know? And you, I gave it to a client, and it took six years to sell. The simplest idea, clearest idea, but it was different. And so persistence, and God willing, there are more people like Mike Darnell out there, because you, when you have a buyer that has, or Jim Peritori, or a few people in the business that have a vision that are willing to take a chance, you know, in the old, I mean, Fred Silverman, people like that, that, you know, they failed, but they weren't afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. And they were, and when you're not afraid to fail, again, fearlessness again, and you try something different, and it works, and you start something brand new, and then everyone follows you, that's a great feeling. Yeah, and I, the, I was, uh, not being afraid to fail is critical that you need to realize you can fail and then can, and, and move on. If you fear failure, you'll never succeed. But the other thing that I learned is that I'm a salesman. And you know, a lot of people don't want to like, it's, it seems like uh, you don't want to call yourself. I'm a salesman and I sell. You know, I will sell a show, I will sell a source to give me information you know, and say to them, you can trust me, I will, you know, I will give you an honest story. And when I say sell, I'm not talking money, but I'm saying you go to a source and you say, look, you know, this story is gonna get out. I can do this story right. There's a reason this story should come out. You're selling. I mean, a good reporter is a salesman. I mean, why did Woodward and Bernstein get deep throat? I mean, they, you've gotta sell. You've got to sell. You got to sell a show. You got to know how to sell. To me, one of the worst things, which I, I do not understand, is PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> I, 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 and and to me, I just think loser when I see this. No, and, and no, and, and I'll tell you why. I, I cannot, I, I can't almost. I can't stop smiling in a room when I see this because it's like somebody brought me in a room, and they're reading. It's like I could read that five times, 20 times faster than them reading me this screen. And it's like the worst salesmanship ever. And, pe and everybody does it, and I don't get it. It's like I, ne I never walk in with notes. You know, I, I believe in myself, and I'm a salesman. And I fail a lot, but sometimes I succeed. And and, and I think that a lot of, and I, God knows you've seen this too, there are a lot of people who are buyers who are so scared of failure themselves that they're easy prey. And the way I do it is I will go in and I will just make it clear to them, I've got a great show and you don't want it, fine. I'm gonna get it on the air somewhere else. And that fear sometimes makes them buy your show. Well, there's, there's and, also and trust. True. You know, as a salesman, as a successful salesman, you've got to be trusted. And so you've got to, you know, you got to, if you're going back to the well over and over again, you've had to deliver the goods. Right. And I always said to everyone, and some of them are here tonight, uh, some of my former assistants who are now star agents, I said, make <coughs> sure that, that you always really you, you strategize before you take a show out to sell because you want that buyer to never say, oh shit, Mark Itkin's coming in to pitch me a show, it's gonna be a loser. You want to make sure that that buyer says, wow, I know it's gonna, I may not buy it, but at least it's, he's not gonna waste my time. And that's really, really important. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Harvey, this question's for you. Uh, when you mention TV and internet, from what I understand, I seem to hear a lot about the combination of um, content that's visual in terms of video, video and th th stuff that streams. But another thing that's been happening, at least I think in my world, is readership is up. When you have things like Huffington Post, people like to read, even through online. And so when you make the prediction that internet will be gone and we have to find that we Connectivity will remain, but it won't be this wall. What do you have to say about the future of readership and where does it fall in that? When I was 
describing this, I used the word text as part of it. And that is readership. That, you know, when I started TMZ, I made a decision that I wasn't going to call anybody a reporter. That my people are called producers. Because they are not just writing some text and throwing it up like a newspaper. They are producing for the experience before them. And that may be a story that is text driven. Or it may be a story that is video driven and you want to drive people into the video and the text becomes almost more of a tease into the video. And it may be a combination of a video at the top with text putting it in context and then midway through a photo gallery that enhances it and then further down more text to further explain and then as you drive down further as people are invested in the story interactivity. But what I said, I didn't say text goes away by any means. The way we produce now and the way we've produced on the website for 12 years is it's story specific. That sometimes it's all text. I mean the Mel Gibson story, all text. That was it. I mean we didn't have any video, we didn't have any photos, but it was a huge story. The Ray Rice story that we broke was a video story, right? I mean, Ray Rice knocked his fiance out in an elevator for you to see. And we got that video. That is a video story. It's ridiculous to overwrite it. You know, what you want to do is drive people into the video because the power is in the video. And sometimes it's a combination of those things. But this is not to say text goes away. It's that what I was suggesting is that every time you're producing content of entertainment or information, you look at what you're doing, you step back, and you say, what's the best way of producing this? Is this a text-driven story, a video-driven story, a combination? Are we putting interactivity in? How are you doing it? So, you know, there's a richness to this that if you can do a story that would normally be text, but you have an ability to integrate video and photos and bring it to life, why not? I would choose that. Now, you may choose, I don't want to see video, I don't want to look at photos, I just want text. And hey, the marketplace will decide and maybe there's room for both. I think that the combination where you produce the experience is going to win. That's my opinion. But I was never suggesting that readership goes away. It's that you contextualize it based on the experience that you're presenting. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, so my boyfriend and I, we're also two Jews from Southern California. <laughs> um, Congratulations. He, <laughs> he's also from Reseda and I'm from Orange County. And we're both um, in the process of applying to law school and both want to get into the entertainment industry. We've been applying for a long time at like various production companies and agencies. Um, so I'm just wondering how, how is getting your foot in the door different to how you think it is today and do you have any suggestions of how to do so? Well, it's never been easy, you know. Um, and, and, you know, it always helps if you know somebody, okay? But I think, again, it, it, it kind of comes back again to the theme of what we've been talking about here today and how do you distinguish yourself? How do you make yourself jump out from the clutter, you know, so that somebody is, wants to take that chance and says, hey, you know what, she's, or he's got something extra, th is thinking about things in a different way. Um, that's, I think, in a, <laughs> in a tough competitive world, that's, I think, whether it was 40 years ago or it's today, you somehow have to distinguish yourself. And I mean, I guess you could say luck's a little element and meeting the right people, but it's still it all comes down to who you are and how you sell yourself. I mean, it's just like Harvey talking about selling, you know, somebody, um, you know, for a, you know, to, to for a new story. It's same thing. There was a kid that worked for me as an intern when I was at CBS. Um, I'm going to mention his name because I love this guy and I'm so proud of him. His name's Andrew Glassman, and his very, Mark knows him well, and he uh, was a, uh, 
you know, his dad was a very, is a very famous plastic surgeon. His stepmom was Victoria Principal. He had a privileged life. And he worked as my intern. Actually, he was at NBC. And he was 16, 17 years old. And there was something about him that I thought, this kid's got it. And he went to USC, and we stayed in touch. And I just thought, good things are going to come to this guy. So he graduated. And he called me a week after graduation. And he said, hey, I just want to thank you for everything. And um, you know, I've applied for all these jobs, and uh, I got turned down. So I'm going to go into, he was going to do something in his father's business, and I forgot what it was. He said, I'm just going to. So I said, could we meet after work? Actually, I was at CBS, because I remember where we went. And I said, can we meet after work? And so he showed up at this bar. And I walked in, and I sat him down, and I said, you spoiled little shit. I said, you know, that you have tried for a week to get a job, and you can't get a job, and you're quitting? And I, and, and, and I just looked at him, and I said, Andrew, you are, you are so much better than that. And I said, make your own luck. You're going to, you know, because you wanted to be a reporter. And I said, you go, get in your car and drive across the country and stop at every television market and go in there and somebody's going to get, have just gotten fired and they're going to need somebody and you get that job. And so he said he was going to do it. And like, I don't know, five or six days later, I get this call and it's Andrew and he is just like beyond excited. He's in Albuquerque and the CBS station just fired somebody. <laughs> and, and Andrew got the job. And then, like, six months later, he, he came to L.A. and he said, I want to show you my reel. And he shows me this reel. And I was thinking, OK, this is going to be really green, because I know how bad I was when I started doing it. And I just thought, I'll be nice and encouraging. And I looked at this, and I thought, it's fucking great. And it was, he was good. And so, he, a short story, he ends up at CBS in Albuquerque. He goes to Philly as the investigative reporter. He is the lead reporter in New York City. Comes back to LA, goes on CNBC, and then says, I'm going to start a production company. Does Average Joe. He's successful. He has the wall on NBC right now. The wall. I'm, it's like, that's how to do it. You make your own luck, and you you don't um, and you don't stop. Persistence. <laughs> yeah. And... Sorry, Andrew. Yeah. Oh, okay. So speaking on the topic of making your own luck, with the increasing atomization of information out there, you know, some people are becoming uh, YouTube content creators. By the way, I'm a YouTube content creator. My name is Revolutionary Thinking on YouTube, if you're all interested, made my own luck. Hopefully some of you <laughs> will type that in. But how, how do you get eyeballs to come to your idea or your channel? What, what do you do? You just put your something on Facebook, share it with your Facebook friends, uh, go out into a park, have little slips of what your channel is. How do you advertise yourself so people can come and take a look at you? I mean, it's, it's an impossible question to answer. That, you know, there's this zeitgeist and you got to plug into it, and there's no rhyme or reason. Trending topics. Yeah, you can do that, but you know everybody's trying to do that. I mean, part mm -hmm. of it is just you, you just stay creative, and you're going to do, I mean, look, you know, I, I tell my office that you know, the, the, the key to success is you know, finding 12 ways around the word no, that whenever, whenever you get turned down or shut down, you find a different path in. And, you know, when I, you know, when I'm working on a story, I fail most of the time. You know, I'll call 30 people and I get no, 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 no. And I just keep going until f suddenly, Persistence. you know. Persistence. And, 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 you know, that means in what you're talking about, you've got to be creative and you've got you to be aware of what seems to be hitting, but that doesn't mean you're going to hit. And, and, you know, it's like there's no magic to any of this. There is no magic to any of this. You know, it's, it, 
You can't say, okay, I'm going to create something and automatically be successful. You can't. I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. There is a degree of luck and timing to things. And sometimes, you know, if you're just out there all the time and you're in the game, you're more likely to hit it. It's like being in Vegas, you know, that, you, you know, you're, you're not going to do well and then you'll do well. Yeah. But it's being in the game, being creative. But, you know, everybody is looking for that magic formula, the magic bullet. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And, the, and that's the, the, you know, that's a good way of ending for me at least, that you can't walk out of any place and say, okay, here's the formula where I will succeed. All of that stuff is BS. And when you hear about, you know, real estate, get rich quick, it's all BS. It's the same thing. It's understanding what you're doing, being creative, being out there all the time, and not and not folding from rejection, mm -hmm. or not folding from a lack of success. You know, I, I don't know if you saw the movie The Founder, which is about Ray Kroc and McDonald's. And the guy was an asshole. Oh, <laughs> the worst. But, you know, and I think the movie ends where, you know, he, he comes out and he looks in the camera and he says, persistence. You know? Th that's not magic, and that's certainly not something new. As we close this evening, our last question was about YouTube content. I'd like to mention that we will be streaming tonight's program on our own YouTube channel for the department, so stay tuned for an email about that. Um, and I want to thank all of our friends and alumni who joined us this evening to um, be part of this very special event. Um, and please join me in thanking Mark and Harvey for their time tonight. <laughs> <laughs>